<laughs> oh, Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on tonight. I'm excited. Well, for all of our guests who were there, that was two riveting first sessions. Um, Anna yeah. really did a great job. I wish that we still had her social account up so we could all give her props, but you got to love tech challenges. Um, really fast before we kind of kick off this second hour, I do want to, um, anyone who's new who's joined us, you are joining in for Journey to Social Entrepreneurship. This is a virtual summit exploring the relationship between service and social entrepreneurship. A couple of sponsors that is good to kind of call out. First, um, all the legwork in this event was created and put on by NGS Movement, and that was Anna, who was just with us. And then Positive um great. I mess up my own name. Positive Impact Podcast. And that's me, despite my inability to say it. Um, also, big shout out and thanks to all of our partners, the Aspen Institute of Franklin Project, Service Year, Blab, and Ashoka U. Great. Well, Alex, you look like you were having a lot of fun in that uh, in the green room back there. <laughs> yeah, I, I was kind of I was kind of jealous that I didn't get to join. You guys were all laughing and having a great time. So now we get to have you for a lively session. Um, first, as we start, can you introduce yourself quickly for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Alex Bryan. I am uh, a few different things at different times, I guess. Uh, I, I, I co-own uh, Food Field, which is a four-acre urban farm in the city of Detroit, uh, which is, I think, what we'll probably focus a bit more on today. Um, my day job is at the Greater Lansing Food Bank, where I'm the director of agricultural programs, so overseeing community garden program and farm business development program. Uh, and I'm also on the board of a few different organizations, National Young Farmers Coalition being one of those that I think ties in a lot to what we're talking about and, and focusing on with sort of increasing entrepreneurism in the, in the world. Yeah, you wore a lot of different hats. I was looking at your bio earlier and I was, wait, which organization are we talking about today? Because you are, you're doing a lot of really great things. And before we dive into those, your service, it was with Conservation Corps, correct? Yeah, so I actually did two terms of service. I did one with the California overachiever. Department. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the first time around was just so I could um, uh, get out of college for a little bit. Actually, so we'll see if it's overachieving or not. But um, yeah, I, I did a that works. I did a term in uh, California with the California Conservation Corps uh, as a special half a term. It was for the summer on a backcountry trail crew. So living in my tent, working on tr uh, trails with about a crew of about fifteen. I basically put 45 pounds on my back every day, hike five miles, swing the pick all day, come home, read maybe, or pass out yeah, from exhaustion and do it all again the next day. So. Yeah, carrying 45 pounds, you know, that's no biggie. Yeah, I could yeah, just right. you know, not do that at all. When we go backpacking, my husband makes sure my pack is 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so that's impressive. That's really great. Where were you in California? Uh, mostly in Yosemite for the first bit, uh, just north of there in the Stanislaus National Forest, and then all the way up north. Uh, in the Klamath National Forest, about 20 miles south of Oregon. This is Bigfoot country. I mean, you're talking old growth forest, lichens growing everywhere. Uh, it was, it was actually uh, tourists, Japanese tourists that would come into the nearby towns and they'd cruise through in these like lines of Humvees and they'd all hop out and take pictures, take pictures, looking for Bigfoot. Uh, no joke. So. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I grew up really close to Yellowstone. So, you know, definitely tourists or cameras. Yeah. I don't remember anyone looking for Bigfoot there. No, probably not there. <laughs> oh, so that was your first term of service. What was the second one that you did? Uh, the second one was when I uh, moved back home to Michigan after uh, being out and about for a few years after college. And uh, it was at the Greater Lansing Food Bank where I'm at now, uh, which is, you know, kind of really lucky to be in that, that role in various different ways. So that was as our volunteer coordinator, and uh, I also wore the IT hat and uh, a few other things. Like I think you do at a lot of small and mid-sized nonprofits. Awesome. Now, I really, I know we just asked you about your second one, and that was fantastic. But you mentioned earlier that your first term of service was kind of almost a gap. Yeah. Was that where in the role of college versus um, starting your own career kind of did that fall? Yeah. So the um, the first service was, I, I think between my second and third year of school. Um, so I was able to kind of get out of classes a little bit early, take that summer off and, and take that next semester off uh, and, and do service there. Uh, but it was after kind of doing service that I realized, you know, a degree is really important. It's something I need to go back for um, and, and focus and hone in on what really drives me or at least help understand my passion a bit more. Um, and then the second term of service was 
a bit before, um, at least it was after I moved back, and it was a bit before we uh, launched my, my business, Food Field, in, in Detroit with a, a friend of mine. So, kind of all played a nice gap role for me. <laughs> and let's see, what was the decision to use service as your gap? Um, which it sounds like it was a little bit of a summer opportunity, but most people, when they do the term of service, although Anna was also an exception, what was it that called you to do it during school as opposed to wait until after? Yeah, I think, you know, I think sometimes you get a little um, disenchanted uh, with school and that process is not being very uh, actual. It's very theoretical, right? Very much so. Yeah. So I think that was my way to make it a bit more real and, and understand what uh, yeah, what was um, important to me. So um you know, it was just a good way to explore me, my interests, and, and really get outside for a bit. Um, but, you know, I've always used service as a way to, you know, I, I need the personal break, but I, I don't want to stop contributing to my community, wherever that community might be. You just threw down so many great components, components right there, that you use service to really identify who you were, that you did it to de define and really narrow in on your passion. And then lastly, even while you were, you know, to use a term, discovering yourself, you still wanted to give back to your community. That really speaks volumes to the power of service. And so especially when you did your second term, what components from that second term led you to creating Food Field? Yeah, I, I think the idea of really nesting in a community so uh, the Greater Lansing Food Bank is a it's a smaller nonprofit. We covered three counties. Um, I know we now cover about seven counties in Mid Michigan, and so I I, I know my community really well. I, I know folks that are making change. I know uh, not just sort of the leaders, but also the people at the ground level uh, working alongside us, volunteering with us. And so that component of really being intentional about how we work in a community with the community and for the community is. It's something that I think uh, service was able to to teach me really well and, and can often teach others well. I think that's something that we've taken through with, within our farming business is, uh, is really to nest within that, that community. Alex, you are giving us so many amazing, great things, but unfortunately, it's just a little bit hard to hear you. Yeah. I was wondering, do you happen to have a set of iPod earphones or a mic handy? I do have a mic on, but it might not be coming through a well. while. Is it a bit better now or no? That was a little bit better, right? Yeah, so we're hearing that a little bit better. So whatever you're doing, let's keep it there. Does that all sound all right? right? Yeah, sounds good. Oh, so I can probably that speak that maybe a little bit louder. I don't know. Yeah, just a little bit louder would be really helpful. Can do. Great. Food Field is just really cool. And you kind of gave a little bit of an overview, but your audio was kind of in and out. Can you describe this organization for us? Yeah, Food Field is my, my business. Um, uh, a for-profit uh, urban farm in, in the city of Detroit. So um, we have about oh, 120 fruit trees. We grow an acre and a half of vegetables. Uh, we have uh, layer hens for, for eggs. We have two hoop houses, which are unheated uh, greenhouses, basically. A uh, very necessary tool for growing up here in the cold, cold north. I think it's about eight degrees tonight. Um, I was noticing your hat and, yeah. you know, living in San Diego, it reminded me that other places, you know, have winter. <laughs> Unfortunately, yep, there is winter here. So, um, yeah, so we, we grow uh, generally year round uh, in, in the hoops um, and we, we grow fish in one of our hoop houses. So we have a small aquaponic setup. We're growing catfish and bluegill. Um, you know, the, the farm is really uh, sort of a bit of everything. And um couple of their highlights. Yeah, we're, we're uh, off grid. So the farm is uh, solely powered by the sun, which is um, amazing and challenging at the same time. <laughs> cool. yeah. Yeah. So this, your urban farm is actually in the middle of Detroit, right? You're like on a city block. How hard is that to actually permit? Yeah, we um, we're lucky enough to work uh, in the city where we, we established ourselves about five years ago now uh, and met with some uh, leaders in, in the uh, planning department and, and elsewhere um, and, and food is food is necessary and I think people of Detroit and the leaders of Detroit understand that and so while there's not direct um, sort of permitting for urban agriculture we're actively working on that and passing legislation so two years ago we 
we passed uh, local zoning so that agriculture would be permitted. Right now we're in the process of passing some zoning um, permitting for livestock. So looking at goats and chickens, um, things along those lines. Uh, bees and some chickens are already permitted. So it's been a process. I think we sort of skirted that legal gray area for a while and, and we're happy to be more in that realm and, and really pioneering that realm of making it legal for others to do this. Uh, it's always been our intent to not necessarily go in and, and sort of have a business and be tucked in, but you know, show how we can, um, how farming could be viable for others. Um, so it really works like you're walking hand in hand with uh, the different legislation. What was it like to create the partnerships with those organizations? Yeah, uh, it takes time. You know, I think one of the few great lessons, uh, one of the many great lessons, I guess, that I've, I've learned is that uh, time and patience goes a long way. I think when we started off, um, two young white boys that didn't grow up in Detroit, uh, you know, for the first year or two, there's a lot of skeptical eyes. And I think people are still skeptical and, and, and rightfully so uh, to some degree. Uh, but it takes, you know, after a couple of years, people um, realize that we're, we're here to stay and we're here to contribute to the community that we, we call home. And um, I think that's, uh, that's been powerful and it's been helpful. And I think that's one of the bigger lessons that we can learn as entrepreneurs is, is to really stick with it and, and show up day after day. Uh, people will um respect that definitely time hard work commitment it's hard to argue with those things right <laughs> yeah right. absolutely um urban farming it just seems like so challenging for me to figure out a actual for-profit model can you kind of walk us through how that works yeah we uh we sell at a few different markets so I mean, we're producing quite a bit of food um on that you know few acres of veggie production the eggs the fish the, the fruit uh, so we sell at um, a few farmers markets, including Eastern Market in Detroit, which anyone gets a chance to come to Detroit, check out Eastern Market on a Saturday. There is there's no other food hub like it. You know, it rivals uh, uh, Pike Market in Seattle, I think, or uh, the Wharfs in, in, in Seattle. Uh, I'm sorry, San Fran. Um, yeah, an amazing market. So we're there. We sell to our community through a CSA or sort of a, a weekly veggie subscription. If those aren't uh, people aren't quite familiar with that, so we get money up front from individuals. We deliver a box of food uh, each week through the season. Uh, and then we sell wholesale to restaurants, caterers, and, and surprisingly, a lot of uh, pop-up restaurants that are happening in Detroit. So finding an old warehouse space or a, a kitchen that's maybe not in as much use anymore and, and pop-up dinners that are pretty regular. So um, yeah, we, we sell produce like mad and, uh, <laughs> and hopefully make it all work at the end of the year that we have cash flow. Uh, definitely a goal for an urban farm. Um, we're going to pause really fast. Would you mind refreshing for us? Yeah. That'd be great. Everyone who's joining in, we're just going to take a quick moment to see if we can get Alex's video quality to be just a little bit higher. Gotta love technology and, you know, Wi-Fi signals. And here he is. Welcome back, Alex. Right. How's that? A bit better? Oh, I can see you again. All right. Perfect. Cool. Our blab, our resident blab member Hannah says that it is much better. Good, good, good. Um, the Detroit that you're describing with this food market that actually rivals Pike Market with pop-up restaurants, that's a very different Detroit than what I'm hearing about on the news. What kind of recovery have you been seeing in Detroit? Yeah, it's um, you know, the media is Always fun, kind, uh, and, and not at others. And I think you know we um, we see a Detroit that is burgeoning in food. Uh, I I didn't get down there for about a month, and I think three or four new restaurants opened up that I wanted to check out. Uh, you know that's that's pretty amazing for a city that normally you hear about um, abandoned warehouses and and blight and uh, the city on fire or, or whatever that might be, most violent you know city. Um, there is that side of Detroit, of course, you know, it's, uh, it's a very uh, tenuous city at times, but there's such a spirit there and, and always has been um, that I think we're uh, really seeing that rebirth come through uh, often in food. You know, I think food is one of those few binders that we could have across cultures and across uh, backgrounds to, to really connect people together. 
I'm so you, glad that you drove that parallel home because it's actually something that I wanted to ask is what relationship do you okay. see between this food culture, whether it's actual hands-on farming or if it's um, new restaurants and other things popping up, what role does that have in the actual um, rebirth of Detroit or the kind of growing? Yeah, we um, food connects all of us, right? Uh, we all have to eat. We all like to share a meal generally. And if you're sharing a meal, it's hard to fight with someone while you're doing that you know, uh, Thanksgiving dinner with notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think um, we, we've been really intentional about where we sell our produce. Uh, we could grow it in the city and sell to the suburbs at a higher uh, dollar value. Um, sort of claim this, you know, grown in Detroit and we're off selling for a larger amount. Uh, that's not our interest. You know, our interest mm -hmm. is to bring our community together over food. Uh, we sell on site at our farm stand uh, we're able to take EBT and SNAP uh, to make sure that our food is accessible for all of our community and, and not just those that can afford it. Um, you know, farming is hard. We have to charge uh, a decent price for what we, we have, uh, but we're able to discount that towards our immediate neighbors and, and then offer other alternatives to make sure that, that folks can have it. Um, and if everyone can have access to good food in Detroit, I think that's when we really start to see uh, the community come together. And especially they can come together right in their own neighborhood at your farm, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we started um, uh, every other Friday this last summer to have a cafe on site, Friday afternoon, evening, kind of a la carte. So we were able to harvest what we had fresh from the, uh, the farm. We had a, a tandoor oven that was donated by a, a great friend of mine, an artist, Amy Francescini, uh, part of her Flatbread Society project. And um, yeah, we're, we're just making tandoori bread and, and harvesting fresh salads and People would walk up, people would drive up, you know, kind of coming from all over friends, new friends, uh, neighbors and new neighbors. So, Basically where I need to be this summer, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Come on by. Now, this is just such an odd complex, especially, you know, with the bigger city like Detroit to have your farm there and to be having and bringing in livestock. Are any of your neighbors kind of scared or intimidated or just uncertain about what you guys are doing inside this city block? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's uh, some skepticism, of course, and I kind of mentioned that the first couple of years, there's a lot of just, you know, we'll see how long they last. Um, <laughs> but I think there's there's also uh, much more excitement when I think they, their kids come by. So each year, we, we the last few years, we've had a kind of a Halloween themed party, end of the year harvest party, uh, pumpkin carving and things like that. Oh, and cool. so, right, and so, Nothing really binds us together with our neighbors better than having their kids come by, carve some pumpkins, hang out, hold the chickens. Man, I've never seen so many five-year-olds wanting to hop in a chicken. You, you get hang out. you get to hold the chicken. Hang, hang out and hold the chicken. Yeah, uh, but but that really breaks down those barriers, right? So when they can see it's safe for their kids, it's safe for their community and, and safe for them. And I think that's that's the way we've been able to tie better to our neighbors, so that when somebody's walking around the farm and we're out there. They call us, right? And 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 that's important. It shows that they're they've bought into the, the farm and, and kind of making sure that it stays and lasts. And that's uh that takes a while. It takes a while, but yeah, mostly playing with chickens, I think, helps to smooth everything. Yeah. Better. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say now you have this whole new way of getting to know your neighbors. You know, I would have thought to bring over cookies. My mother in law, you know, takes over zucchinis. You yeah. have them hold your chickens. Yeah. It all works out well. Okay. Yep. <laughs> oh. At this time, I'd love to, and Hannah says, chicken cuddling solves all problems. <laughs> it really does. Um, I have yet to try it, though, but I can imagine. Um, so I really want to dig back into those early days. As an entrepreneur and really defining the social entrepreneur mission, how hard was it to kind of blend regular traditional entrepreneurship with farming with this social component? Yeah, like I mentioned, we, um, we purposely or intentionally uh, miss out on some of the market we could have uh, you know, because we could sell things for a higher dollar value elsewhere and that's uh, that's not worth it to us it's, it's more worth it for us to be at the local farmers market up the street um, I think it pays back in other ways and it's really important to think about that sort of this triple bottom line we, we talk about right like it's yeah it needs to be a viable economic business but it, it also needs to invest in the community because that returns later for us in, in many different ways. Um, I'm stronger, my business is stronger if my neighbor is fed, 
If my neighbor has a roof on their house, if they have health insurance, I mean, those are all really key things that if those basics are taken care of, uh, then the quality of life of everyone in my community is, is better. And so that's, uh, it's challenging though. You know, it's really challenging when you're looking at, well, year three, we're still you know, not quite showing a profit on paper. I'm driving down every weekend or I'm, I'm working every weekend there as well as you know, my job during the week. Uh, it's exhausting, um, but it, it starts to turn a corner and, and um, we eventually start to have a bit of income coming out of the business. I think that's definitely a trend that we've seen through many of our guests is having multiple jobs <laughs> where you have your main job that's bringing in your income and it takes a little while to get that social enterprise off the ground. What was, if you're looking back, what was one of the key moments that you looked back at that startup phase and you just went, we're going to make it, you know, this is going to like actually last, this is going to go forward. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I, I think in some ways we had a little bit of blind faith. Uh, you know, I think we kind of needed to and need to at times. Um, but I think when when we had uh, our sort of first community gathering on the farm and we saw people that we didn't know show up, right? So um, that's a you made it moment. It really is. Like, it, oh, it's not just my mom hanging out with us, you know, like it's actually or my grandma it. commenting on my page. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that, uh, or when I heard someone speaking about uh, food field and business that they didn't know, you know, I was involved, they didn't know that uh, we were even standing there, but, you know, talking about the farm, it's like, okay, well, this is, this is bigger than just us in our immediate circles now. And I think that's, um, it's one of those points of pride. And it's also one of those, like, okay, we're, we're reaching our community um, and, and doing what we've sort of set out to do. Oh, now those moments when you started to hear other people not connected to your immediate circle, how far into the process was it before you started hearing that outside feedback? Yeah, it takes a couple of years. <laughs> you know? That's good to know. I mean, that's yeah. for everyone here. It's not an overnight, mm -hmm. you know, it's nothing's an overnight success. It takes multiple years of multiple jobs. Yeah, it really, it really does. I think there's uh, you know, we can look at sort of innovations in the tech world and still see that. Zuckerberg didn't sell Facebook, you know, within a year or two. I mean, it took a few few years to really scale that business to that that point. I don't think I'm going to be a billionaire for my urban. <laughs> no preconceived notions of oh, grandeur there, but uh, it does it does take that time. It takes that investment, um, and that this will be something that allows me to have a a, a future business uh, down the road. You would need all of Detroit if you yeah. were going to turn this into a billion yeah. dollar yeah, organization. So. Might but say something about how we value uh, uh, different things in our lives. Food, maybe we should value a little higher, but you know, <laughs> I'm um, biased on that one. So <laughs> I've got another challenging question for you. And it's one that I love to ask my podcast guests is looking back, as, you know, roller coaster of the startup. There's always, you know, missteps. There's things you do well. What is one of your favorite mistakes that you made? Uh, I think, yeah, I might even answer one of the other questions that comes up there. How do you get the community's trust? Um, so we, we <laughs> sidestepping uh, that one. <laughs> well, it, it, it sort of answers at the same time. So we, uh, Perfect. we want to make sure that our farm looks decent for the community. Right. And the first year we were out there, um, we had our, our mower break and we weren't able to mow. And we get a note from a neighbor that's like, hey, when the city owned it, it was mowed, you know? Uh, and that's, it, he's the guy I'd never met him before, didn't really meet him afterwards. Uh, but that was a really clear message that we have to um, honor our, our neighbors and our community. And, and we, we mowed, you know, we, we found a way. We, we found a way, we fixed the mower, but we contracted that somebody out beforehand to come in and, and get things knocked down and, and get the, the the farm uh, meeting the expectations of the folks that were around us. You know, that's uh, that's a really important thing, and especially in a city where there's tens of thousands of vacant uh, acres. Um, mm -hmm. So when it's unmowed, it's dangerous, and it's dangerous in a lot of different places because of that. And it's so it's a it's really a sign or a marker of the stability of a community in Detroit. And so that that mowing is it means a lot to folks. And so we, yeah, big one to miss up on, and and something we. And make sure that it stays uh, presentable at all times. <laughs> that is good because especially, you know, with a farm, even though you have these other aspects throughout the community, that's kind of your 
you know, your front porch almost. It's like, this is what we're doing. We're trying to revitalize this community. We're trying to bring it together. Mowing the lawn kind of does help, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, we got to keep it looking nice, you know. It's the, the advantages and disadvantages of an urban farm, right? So, you know, the disadvantage is that got to keep things looking a little bit better. Uh, the advantage is I'm really close to the market, you know, so we can sell that it right there on the farm, uh, close to a volunteer labor force or a, a paid labor force right there in the community. Uh, disadvantages, I'm, I'm far from a neighbor that I can borrow a tractor from. I'll tell you, that's, that's a little tricky. Although, you know, growing up in Idaho and living in Montana for five years, granted, Bozeman, Montana is much, much smaller <laughs> than Detroit, but it wasn't uncommon to see a tractor going down the road. It kind of caused the only traffic jams I saw during that time period. <laughs> At this time, I'd love to remind all of our audience watching that you guys can ask questions. We'd actually love to get some audience questions. That's forward slash Q, and we will answer those here. Um, until we get some of those amazing community questions that I know you guys are all thinking of right now, you talked a lot about these other vacant lots throughout Detroit. Are, do we have future farms that are going to pop up in those? What else do you guys have for the future? Yeah, we, um, we don't have uh, a strong need to expand significantly. Uh, we're about four acres. We've looked at some lots nearby and probably going to do some, some work on those in the next couple of years to have a squash field or a small corn field or something like that. Uh, but the idea that um, I would much rather see 10,000 people each own one acre than one person own 10,000 acres. Oh. Right. And so while we can be a viable business, it doesn't mean we can, we need to displace all the other viable businesses out there. Like small, small to mid sized businesses, that's the lifeblood of, of the US and needs to maintain that way. I think when we look at some of the problems that we've seen in Detroit, because we had a large consolidation of industry, <laughs> right? The big three. And mm -hmm. uh, when things don't go well with the big three, everyone fails. And, and so um, that's my interest. And, and I, I think um, that's what we'll continue to push for personally and, and, and sort of in that, that realm of, of work we do. And, and we're seeing that. Uh, there are other urban farms in Detroit more and more popping up. Uh, it's not as easy to get land as when we did a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the city is kind of revamping and, and looking at their policies for, for selling that land again, which is, which is great. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there is, I guess, in thousands of acres of, of vacant land, which is, which is quite remarkable. Do you guys, with kind of this encouragement of other urban farms and other ones that are coming to the table, do you guys do any mentorship or kind of facilitating of this is how our model works? Here's some ideas and suggestions of things that you can do. Yeah, we've been able to help a few other farmers out. Uh, one of our early apprentices, our second year, uh, Donnie is, is now farming uh, up near Eight Mile. He's got his own space. Uh, he's able to sort of adopt a park up that way, and he's is farming and uh, for business, you know, for profit business up there. Um, you know, that's that's a cool feeling uh, when we're able to say have somebody work with us for a year, learn a bit what about what we're doing, how we're farming, and then take that elsewhere and and create his own business out of it. Uh, that's our goal. Um, and I hope so that we can continue to foster that uh, development of, of businesses because again, we're stronger if uh, all of our community is stronger. There's plenty of market share to be had in local ag. Right now, so. <laughs> well, one of the things I'm sure you're finding already, particularly with that story, is farming is kind of addictive. It's this very romanticized, it's very hands-on and it's very rewarding. Yeah. Um, having, as I said, mentioned growing up in Idaho, um, my husband actually worked on a cattle ranch for years and, um, he had, you know, mentioned that maybe someday we would own a cattle ranch and that wasn't quite in the cards for me, but, you know, it's this very rewarding lifestyle. And I'm sure that as you guys, you know, encourage more people to adopt this lifestyle, they're just going to be very excited. Yeah. Farming, farming is hard. Definitely. The pastoral images, um, uh, has a lot of nostalgia, though, I think, to, to the U.S. Americans. You know, we, most of us farmed as far as the population, high percentage of our population farmed not that long ago. And hopefully we can shift that needle a little bit back towards more folks <laughs> here in the future. Uh, well, I know also just we're so tech driven and we're so now, you know, attached to our computers, attached to our phones. Um, that just the ability to go out. I joined a community um, garden here and just the exhaustion that I had after being in a day building this community garden because we were actually in the initial phases 
that was really kind of magical. I mean, I know I couldn't move for like two days, but, <laughs> but it was a really rewarding yeah. experience. Yeah, and so th there is a bacteria that lives in the soil that on contact with skin releases dopamine. It does, it scientifically makes you happier to garden, right? So sticking mm -hmm. your hands in the dirt, you will be happier because of that. And I think that's, oh, man, I'm sold, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we just had a great question from one of our guests. And I'm sure it has like at least six different words that I can't say, but I'm going to try. Yeah. Yeah. With your fishery operations, have you looked into aquaponics, combined aquaculture hydroponic systems that have space and utilize waste streams. I think he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, we, we do run an aquaponic system. We have our uh, about an 8,000 gallon tank in ground in one of our hoop houses. Uh, and then we have two raised beds that uh, are above that tank that run the length of the whole tank uh, that filter out that water where we have plants growing. So the fish below, plants growing up above, the plants are growing in the, the sort of waste from the fish, filtering the water. And going back down to the fish below. Uh, we do catfish and bluegill as they're native and um, it's really important to us to have something that's native and once the system's refined, man, it's gonna be eating a lot of perch once we figure that one out. So, <laughs> so kind of walk me through, I can't even imagine, where did the idea to grow your own fish come from? A few different ways. I, I think Growing Power, um, which is in Milwaukee, uh, has done a, a great job. Will Allen up there is the sort of championed um, the concept uh, and you know there's not unfortunately a lot of refined knowledge on it going forward and so we're kind of pioneering that i think uh, that field a bit um and so it's it's challenging to say the least <laughs> we, to grow fish in the winter in detroit outside yeah. i mean I, I can't imagine what the challenge would be all no, right nothing like hauling we thought we had a leak in our pond liner so nothing like hauling out a pond liner probably, you know, five, 600 pounds. It's covered in fish waste. Our ducks are swimming in it. There's a rotten duck egg. Ah, the smell. Like at that point I was just like, you know, really, what am I, what am I doing right now with my life? I'm covered in fish waste. I smell horrible. Uh, and I, yeah. Anyway. It brought you back to those service days all the way back in the Yosemite, you know, out in the wild, 45 yeah. pounds on your back. Yeah. We didn't talk about how frequent or infrequent showers were. <laughs> Uh, yep. <laughs> yep. Bathing in the cold stream. Uh. So while we're kind of talking about the challenges and the difficulties, what systems do you guys have during the winter? Does a, does a farm kind of go fallow? Do you guys keep it going? Yeah, we, we scale back quite a bit. So we have these two unheated greenhouses that we use. Uh, so they're able to help us keep through some production. We're able to grow some greens year round. So kale, spinach, uh, maybe if we have some carrots in the ground, we can continue to harvest them through the winter. Sort of think like a, like a storage system, almost like a walk-in cooler uh, for some of our stuff. Um, and then we, we've grown things that we can store so we can sell garlic through the winter, potatoes through the winter. Um, you know, luckily we, we also are really intentional. Uh, my business partner is taking February off, just leaving, going down south, working on a couple of farms, traveling around. Uh, it's important to take a break. We work really hard during the season. and I think it's good to, I don't know, take a, take a slight break. I think this is what the Japanese do, the Japanese farmers, this is when they would write haikus, is during the mm -hmm. winter. So, they're writing haikus all winter, I don't know. So I'm expecting that poem book, all yeah. of haikus, you yeah. know, coming out, you guys. We have a publisher coming on later this week. You guys can connect and we can yeah, have exactly. it distributed, you know, within a couple months. Yeah. It's no big uh -huh. deal. Perfect, yeah. Great. Um. It looks like we are working out some tech difficulties with Kyle. So if you don't mind hanging with us a bit longer, sure. we'd love to have you. Oh, wait, we're good. All right. So we are good. So Kyle, if you're in the room, do you want to call in? <laughs> we're working through the green room. While he's calling in, my last question, what do you guys grow? Or what's your favorite thing that you grow? Favorite thing. I personally try to grow a new crop that shouldn't be grown in this area every every year. So whether that's uh, hibiscus or uh, cardoon or artichoke, um, I really try and focus in on, on something that just pushing the envelope a little bit uh, so that we can introduce some something else to our, our region. All right. So I expect a full update next year of both all of your haikus and what new crops you guys were able to grow this year. You, you bet. Thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for yeah. joining. Yeah.